Welcome to Fort Knox. Once again, I am John Fort, uh, here this time with David Zamir, uh, the CEO, founder of NANA, um, which is doing a type of training and work preparation that probably doesn't get talked about enough when we talk about upskilling uh, and we talk about um, ed tech. Uh, because a lot of the population gets left out of the usual conversation. So I want to start off like I always do, David, and ask, what is the toughest problem that you are solving for today? John, thanks for having me. The toughest problem we're really solving for is the fact that 35 million people are going to lose their jobs because of technology automation by 2030. And there are some industries where we have lack of supply of tradespeople. And there are not enough tradespeople in the country, so there's an opportunity to create more than 5 million jobs by 2028 in the trades. At the same time, we got a glimpse into a future with high unemployment during the pandemic. So the pandemic led to people, unfortunately, losing their economic security. Imagine walking in a restaurant and suddenly overnight there is this variant and this restaurant shut down. So during the pandemic, many people from hospitality came to Nana Academy, learned trade skills, which has more security because there, there were many essential workers, and then they became tradespeople and could support their families. So right. the biggest problem we are solving is really economic security and diversification of skills. Now, let's get this in context. I've been doing some work on this over the years, and there have been a number of studies done about what artificial intelligence um, machine learning is going to do to the economy. And generally speaking, what tends to come out is that the very lowest skilled labor, a lot of that will still be there. The very highest skilled labor will still be there. But a lot of middle wage jobs um, that uh, don't require particular skills will get wiped out, right? And so you'll end up with... Um, a, a really uh, underappreciated and underskilled and under-resourced uh, segment of the economy unless we do something. Um, so what types of skills are you talking about? Are you talking about appliance repair? What are the sorts of things that uh, Nana Academy is doing? Right now, we really focus on the appliance repair trade where this problem of not enough tradespeople is the most acute at. Uh, there are only 30,000 appliance repair technicians. It's a 4.5 billion industry. And 40% of them are baby boomers that are about to retire in the next five years. So there is a really key opportunity to generate more people in these skills and make sure that they have a strong career in the trades. Nana in the future is going to do other trades, for example, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and really anything else, including construction. But we really wanted to address the most acute problem right now, which is in the appliance repair trade. So that's our focus. Why? Why? What, what was the inspiration on tackling this of all problems? Yeah, 40% um, are baby boomers uh, in the specific industry. It's an interesting career because you can play puzzle and Lego. You need to figure out the problem and then you need to take the white box apart and put everything back together, which is something that I learned to do when I immigrated to this country back in 2013. I learned how to fix appliances and it changed my life, gave me this sense of economic security. And it was also very playful. And also like looking into the supply chain logistics issues that the country is currently facing. Unfortunately, 50 6% of Americans choose to replace their appliances, right? Which also hurts the environment because only 50% of this 5.3 million uh, municipal solid waste that is generated by major appliances can actually be recycled. So if you think about it, there's an opportunity to generate economic opportunities in the appliance repair trade, which also will improve the quality of service and how fast we can get out to consumers instead of them waiting for two weeks for the refrigerator to be fixed. We can send a technician to their house, let's say same day or within 24 hours, which also increase the time, the total available market of the appliance repair industry, and also make local communities healthier because people in the local community will be employed in a job with a lot of dignity, which is the trade, and save the environment. So, so what's happened? What's happened to the appliance repair business, say, over the past, especially twenty years? 
uh, it seems to me that in the past we have these department stores, we had Sears, whatever, and you'd go, you buy your appliance, and that was where you sort of went for uh, either warranty or just repair in general. Hey, I bought this thing from here. Can you send somebody to fix this for me? Uh, a lot of those stores are dying out. People are buying appliances, perhaps. I mean, sure, people are still going to Best Buy, Home Depot, et cetera, but maybe buying them online. And maybe that relationship isn't there to expect repair to happen. Is that why people are buying new? Or maybe the, the retailers, hey, their incentive is buy a brand new one. Um, we, we don't want to send a repair person. You, you know, uh, there are the original equipment manufacturers, great brands like Samsung and GE, they want to generate, and they do, amazing products into consumers, right? That's their intention. I don't really know what the motives of the retailers, of the these big white box uh, retailers, but I will tell you that in the past 20 years, less people went into the trades, right? And as a parent, do I want my daughter and son to be a computer science or maybe a lawyer or do i want them to be into the trades and the trades were left behind they weren't supported by technology they weren't supported by a strong community and they weren't supported by like this sensing of dignity when it comes to pride right like and that's something we want to change at nana now because there was a lack of tradespeople, the service level also got hurt. And in the past, you're right, people by default went to Sears. But because there were not enough tradespeople, the technicians at big companies had to do more work. And because they had to do more work as employee of a company, they got exhausted. Like I was an appliance support technician. I did anywhere between six to eight jobs a day. It's tough. I need to drive to the client's house. I need to spend time, get, get them familiar with the problem, and then I need to make it on time for another house, another household that's maybe 30 minutes away. And there are some big enterprises that asking from the technicians to do eight to 16 jobs a day, asking them to work six days a week. That's tough. And as a parent, do I want my child to work that hard? And for what? You know? Well, how much how much have the economics changed? So um, if you're a really great technician, what's the path for you from there? I mean, if you if the most you can do is six to eight per day, do you start a small business where you employ other technicians? How do you how do you turn this into um, a, an area that people can go into and not just succeed at a basic level, but also grow? That's an interesting question because we live in a capital market in the US, thank, thankfully, right? Now, if I'm working for a company and I'm a W-2, there is a ceiling of, of how much money I can make. And of course, the employer wants to generate as much efficiency as I can. Now, that's what's so exciting about the Nano model. The Nano model, we pay technicians flat rate fee. And then we help them, uh, like let's say that your washer broke in your house, right? Uh, you call a nano technician to come to your house and imagine the technician can fix the washer potentially in the first visit if parts are not required. And if parts are required, the technician probably will have the part with him and then he can fix your washer on the spot. But what if he doesn't? If he doesn't, you need to wait at least three more days as a consumer and take another day off work and the opportunity cost can be very expensive. And the technician, because he or she gets paid flat rate, now let's say they get paid $100 flat rate, it's split between two different visits, right? And that's what's so unique about the Nana platform. The, ability, the fact that we are taking different economic opportunities from different brands really allows us to build density for technicians and create for them one place, one platform where they can work with all of these different brands and really have density and efficiency in their schedule which again, increase capacity when it comes to the consumers and allows us to create economic opportunities. It's a really win-win. Yeah, it's interesting. So with that density, um, what, what kind of a percentage improvement in the take can a technician get? Uh, we have technicians that uh, used to be W-2s and make $25 an hour. And now on the Nana platform, they make more than $150,000 a year. Okay. 
Okay. Let's sit, let's sit with that for a second. It's mind blowing. Like from yeah, mind blowing from thirty five grand a year to more than one hundred and fifty thousand. And it's thanks to the fact that they have, first of all, they are self starters, entrepreneurs, right? That operate under the Nana brand, under the Nana franchise. And together with the Nana platform and all of the data and how we, the suggestions that the Nana brand and the software drives to their schedule, it's increasing their effective hourly rate. And I'm very proud of it. And um, it's, uh, you know, people go where they can find dignity, agency, and of course, economic opportunities. And I think also talking about parents again, when I was a kid, my mother's name is Nana. So I named my company after my mother's name. It means a lot to me. I want to explain. I think you would appreciate it. When I was a kid, my mom cared for my education, all right, first and foremost. Then she cared about my community. And she wanted me to stay out of, out of troubles and to have friends that will support me to be a better human being. Then she cared about my mentorship. She always there for me. And then she did all of that because she also cared for me to land a good job and have economic opportunities. And thinking about the fact that 35 million people will lose their jobs and we really need to find a different occupation for them, we are building a Nana for the people. For right. The uh, I, I want to get to this question. Um, I, I think it's a good one. And that is, uh, how do you feel these challenges translate into the mental health and neurodivergency space? Um, and mainly, uh, can people perhaps who are on the spectrum, you know, for autism, uh, perhaps find work on the platform? What have you seen uh, in the workforce and how people with different levels of, of um, special ability and capability uh, have been able to thrive and participate? That's a... That's a, an important point to make. I think I want to address this question in two different areas. First of all, let's talk about mental health. Uh, if I work for a company where I don't get a sense that they care for me and they just look at me as a number and they ask me to work six days a week, they burn me out, my mental health probably is not going to be great. We can say that pretty strongly, right? Because we have many technicians that came from a similar background, uh, having the freedom in a gig economy model to really choose what you want to do and, of course, making sure that it is sustainable for you, by default, increasing your happiness. And that's first and foremost the, most, the basics for mental health, right? I want to be safe. I want to be happy. Happy coming from fulfillment. But, of course, first we want safety. And then let's address your other question when it comes to people with disabilities. In the Nana platform, we don't really uh, we don't really evaluate if if people have disabilities this doesn't matter for us uh, there are technicians on the nana platform today that have disabilities and they do work and they're doing a phenomenal jobs and um, lately one of our students robin vostick uh, she's a, a retiree that came back and wanted to become an appliance support technician during the pandemic we told her how to fix appliances. She has some disabilities that I won't name here because, you know, it's private. But uh, with disabilities, she's able to do one to four jobs a day and she's happy. You know, she's respected. <laughs> she helps the local community. So again, going back to your question, first, let's make sure that people are safe. Second, let me, let's make sure that they have fulfillment in their job and they feel appreciated. And Nana is welcoming everybody to come and become an appliance support technician, regardless if they have disabilities or not. If they can do the work, they can do the work. Yeah. Well, the person who asked that question uh, has a business and is hoping to collaborate with you. So maybe we'll check back and see if that's possible. And so now having learned a bit about Nana, uh, I want to learn about you and your story um, and uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, you alluded to this, but where were you born? Tell me about uh, household, your parents, siblings. And I was born in a, a beautiful place that I miss a lot called Haifa, Israel. It's a beach town uh, 45 minutes north of Tel Aviv. And my parents, I'm a first generation Israeli. My parents immigrated uh, from Georgia, which is south of Russia, to Israel back in 1973. 
And I grew up in uh, this small, low socioeconomic level neighborhood in Haifa, Israel, where there was a lot of diversity. And specifically in Haifa, uh, there's diversity of religion as well. Uh, 40% of the citizens are Jewish, another 25% are Christian, and another, another 35% are Muslims over there. And it was a very special place to grow up in because uh, like, there was all of diversity around me, which enabled me to really learn how to partner and to become friends with people from different backgrounds. And I'm very grateful for that. And when it comes to my parents, oh, so much emotions come to me when I'm thinking even about my parents. I'm very grateful for, for I'm very grateful I was born to this family. I have one sibling. She's one year older than me. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur. He had a dentistry lab. So I was growing up and seeing him managing his business. Unfortunately, he passed away when I was 12 years old and he was 38 years old, um, which again allowed me to learn how short life can be sometimes and why it's so important for us to move fast and really go for what we believe is right to go after. And my mom, she's just magical. <laughs> she's a... Uh, after my father passed away, I saw how hard she works and how much she cared about us. And I just wanted to give her back. I'm very grateful for her. She's just hardworking, single mom, that uh, education was the most important thing for her. And for me, I just want to well, make them proud, you know, my sister and my mom. Yeah. T tell me, um, you mentioned the neighborhood uh, where you grew up and the diversity of it. What do you remember about that time, uh, who your friends were? Um, was your friend group from your generation different from who the adults in the neighborhood were associating with? So uh, like Kiryat Eliezer was the name of the neighborhood and it was a melting pot. Um, my best friends, I had the Georgian origins. Uh, one of my other best friends, his parents came from Iraq. A different guy, his parents came from Morocco. A different friend, his name, his family came from East, East Europe. So different cultures. And, you know, at the end of the day, we as the kids, we always actually, I was, we were kind of embarrassed in our heritage at the beginning. We didn't appreciate the diversity in the culture. And we always, we always wanted to be just Israeli. For example, my sister was wise enough to pick up on Georgian for my parents. I didn't. I just wanted to be Israeli. Uh, and uh, in some way, I felt outsider for a, a long time of my life. And uh, looking back at my childhood, I'm very grateful for the diversity. Uh, what were you excited about or into the, the activities that either you would do with your friends or you would do on in your spare time. And you mentioned Lego and things like that earlier. And you uh, got into appliance repair when you moved here, which is quite a bit later in life. But what were what were you tinkering with, if anything, when you were growing up? At what age, John? Um, you know, even elementary school. Elementary school, soccer, soccer, and soccer. Back then, Maccabi Haifa was uh, the champion team in Haifa, Israel. And um, it was fun because uh, the stadium of the best team in, in Israel was literally a seven-minute walk from my house. So when the team scored, I remember as a five-year-old hearing like 15,000 people scream. And I was seven minutes away and it was like so incredible. I'm like, what's going on? I want to go there. And my dream at the beginning was to be a soccer player. You know, I wanted to make it to the Maccabi Haifa team, uh, which I did. Uh, you know, oh. it, it sounds like, excuse me? I said, oh, <laughs> you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it was a big, uh, you know, since I was a kid, I, I, I fell in love with soccer at the age of five. And everybody in the neighborhood played soccer. And uh, my dream was, I, I'm like, I imagined how I'm playing soccer in school with my friends, which we did all the time. Uh, we always met at 3 p.m. after school and played soccer together. And I, I imagined how um, this coach from Maccabi Haifa, his name was uh, Vili, a, a Russian immigrant, 
uh, saw me play and invite me to the team. And guess what happened two years after? He saw you play and invited you to the team. He saw me play and invited me to the team. So, I mean, that's huge. So what, what age is that and what happened then? I was in the Maccabi Haifa school at the age of seven. I was in the school till the age of nine in the soccer school. And then this coach really uh, invited me to the, uh, to the youth team, I joined the youth team, was there for a few months. Oh, yeah. um, what happened? I, I achieved the dream and then I'm like, do I really want to be a soccer player? <laughs> Um, well, really it sounds like if I'm counting the years too, um, you're around 11, 12 at this point, And this is around the time when tragically your father dies. Yeah. Yeah. My, even before that, my parents got divorced. So my parents got divorced when uh, I was nine and a half years old, which was uh, unfortunate for me. I was very close to my parents and it was a, a big moment of my life because I was part of this decision as well as a kid. How so? You know, my mom, again, a very special person for me. And um, she didn't want to break the family um, without us, my, myself and my sister, being part of this decision. And um, when I was eight years old, my mom, it was dark at night. It was winter. It was raining outside. And my room was dark. And my mom is walking in and in, like, David, like, I don't feel great right now with how things are going in the house and I, like how would you feel if we left? And um, and I appreciate it dearly, you know. I, I was eight and a half years old back then, and and I wasn't ready like to say let's do it because my father was my best friend, and I felt that like if I'm saying goodbye to my dad, it will never be the same again. And I'm like, mom, like I know it's hard, but maybe it will get better. My parents used to argue. Um, and then a few months after, my mom did it again. Like, David, like, let's talk about it again because it's really hard here. And I think it could be better. And, um, and I said, okay, mom, let's do it. And uh, the day after, my, we packed our things and we left. Um, was it better? Whew. <laughs> um, it was better for my mom. Uh, I was very sad. And all of us were sad. It's it's not easy to break up a family, right? But uh, it was definitely more quiet in the house, and uh, and that was the most important thing. And unfortunately, you know, my father tried to redeem the situation and uh, and make it right again, but it was too late. Um, and um, it it was hard, right? Uh, myself, I had to see, uh, travel to see my dad uh, two, two, twice a week in a different city. My, myself and my sister, we took the bus, we drove to see him. Um, and then a few years after, out of the blue, my father passed away. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't easy either. So this whole period between the age of eight and a half to, to 12 years old was a time of a lot of pain and a lot of growth. And uh, looking back at some pictures of me from this age you can see a sad kid um, and uh, yeah but again you know as i grew up i learned how to be grateful for these challenges which is sound it's crazy right but if not for these challenges i wouldn't be who i am today and being who i am today i know that everything that happened to me in my life till this day prepared me to be the ceo of this company and yeah, I started. I started eleven different companies before Nana, and um, and it for me it feels similar to how I served the uh, in the Israeli Air Force and I served my country. For me, Nana feels that I serve humanity right now, and I serve all of these people that are um, that need to find a different occup uh, occupation in the next few years. Tell me how that developed from a kid who loved soccer, uh, and who was on a very strong developmental path up until around age 11 or so deals with this separation, this fracturing, this tragedy. And then where does your focus go? Um, how does that change the way you're motivated? Are you motivated as a teenager? Uh, wow. <laughs> Such a painful area. These are hard, hard questions. <laughs> 
Um, okay. Uh, yes, uh, I may, I am motivated as as a twelve year old. It um, I was in the advanced kids class in uh, in high school, in mid school and high school, and uh, everybody were studying very hard. And I was the the silly kid in class that made everybody laugh and try to make sure that. Uh, we don't take life too seriously. And, and thinking back about it today, it probably also came from a place of, I just wanted attention. And I learned how to become funnier. Not that I have great sense of humor today, but uh, back then, yeah, I, I just wanted to laugh and take it back home and bring some joyfulness into, into the house. So that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is really challenging the st st status quo. And I was this kid that didn't have a father, you know, and that, not that anyone judged me, if anything, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs facing imposter syndrome. <laughs> Let's talk about that for a second. Like growing up, like I was in the advanced, advanced, skill, uh, advanced kids class studying biotechnology. And then I was in the student council and I was in a different soccer team after I left Maccabi Haifa. And I was in the uh, school soccer team as well, the captain there. And like, I always in the back of my mind back then thought, oh, I'm not here because I'm smart. I'm here because my father died. <laughs> like people feel bad for me. And so I carried that with me and, and which also drove me to actually work even harder and, and thinking about the opportunity of like, I want to build great things in life. Again, today I'm looking back and I'm very grateful for all of it. But for, for many, many years, I, I had behaviors that stemmed from these situations that I faced in life. When did entrepreneurialism come in? You say you started 11 companies. You got to start early, probably, to, to fit in 11. Yeah, yeah. Uh, entrepreneurship. So as soon as I finished the Israeli Air Force, um, as soon as I finished my service in the Israel, Israeli Air Force, it was um, October 2008. Uh, my, I had my first business by, I'm sorry, it was October 2007. I had my first business by September 2008. It was in New Jersey, out of all places, Elizabeth, New Jersey. So it was a New Jersey, uh, New Jersey Gardens Outlet Mall. Uh, I started a kiosk that's selling hair straighteners. Uh, okay, yeah, I want to get to that, but why do you go from Israel to New Jersey? Why? Because uh, the U.S. is the best place to be an entrepreneur. All right, it's a uh, Israel, it's a smaller market. The U.S. is a bigger market. And the strategy was to also make money in dollars because the conversion in currency was worth so much more. And my dream was just like, I want to save this amount of money and go back to Israel. And let's talk about love. Uh, I met my wife in a trip in Las Vegas two days before I was supposed to go back to Israel to study in college. And uh, I met this uh, beautiful gazelle, this beautiful hummingbird, and I said that I have to come back to the U.S. So I was traveling for 10 months, meeting, met my wife in Las Vegas, went back to Israel for three weeks, talked with my mom, and I'm like, Mom, I met this girl. Um, like, I can go to college right now, and I'll be okay, start businesses in Israel, but if I won't try it for the rest of my life, I'll ask, what if? And my mom gave me $1,000. My sister paid for my airplane ticket. And three weeks after, I was back in the U.S. And I wanted to, like, support. Hold on. Hold on. I have never heard. I've done hundreds of CEO interviews at this point, um, not to put that on it. But I've never heard an I met my wife in Las Vegas story. So so tell me how that happens. How, like, because and, and then we'll get to your mom and your sister giving you money to make this happen. Because usually... What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It doesn't like change the trajectory of your life and your decision to go to college. So tell me about meeting your wife in Las Vegas. Oh, let's talk about the develop economic opportunities in the trades and about. Oh, we'll, we'll get back to that. We're, <laughs> we'll get back to that for sure. But your motivation, like, um, yeah, 
you remember how I told you that I manifested this uh, soccer coach in uh, in uh, when I was uh, a kid, and it happened. So after my father passed away, uh, in Judaism, if you if you read, read the pr the prayers, you see that in some sort we are manipulating God <laughs> a little bit. It's like, oh, you should forgive us because of our great great parents like prayed for you all of these years, and if you don't forgive us, forgive us for that. Know that our intentions are good, and forgive us for that. And then. Um, and since I was a kid, um, right, right. I, going back to the whole like Abraham, Sodom, and Gomorrah thing, like a hundred, a hundred good people. Okay, how about ten? <laughs> All right, how about just one? So I'm a teenager, and um, and I imagine this brown hair, blue eyes, tall girl with a very specific energy coming into my life, uh, and I pray to God, like you took my father away, at least finally like, give me my soulmate. And, um, and I dated different people when I was a teenager and when I was in the Israeli army, but it never went to the next level because I knew that that just wasn't that. I knew what I'm waiting for. And uh, this one afternoon on the, uh, in the Palm, Palms Hotel in Las Vegas, uh, next to the pool, I saw this person and, um, and the rest is his story. And we've been married now for 13 years. Wow. And... And you changed your plans and decided to stay in the U.S. Um, where? And let's go back to the mall now, because you learned uh, skills in interaction, in sales, and understanding the customer there. Uh, how much of that had happened before the Vegas trip? And then how did you pull that forward into what you did next? Yeah. So many, many of us started our first job in the mall. In my case, it was my first business. And talking about skills diversification, I learned how to straight hairs. So le this learning of new skill allowed me to make more than $50,000 in the next 12 months, like saving more than $50,000. And also it allowed me to deal with re rejections, right? Like learn, so learning new skill was the first step. Second, managing the business with all of the mistakes, managing the inventory, teaching uh, salespeople how to sell. Um, I even picked up a language because I, there was, a, there was a, a large Spanish population over there, people that traveled from, uh, from Latin America to come and buy clothes in this huge outlet. So I had to practice my, my pitch in, in, in Spanish. And then there was also some sort of a performance element to it because sometimes I straight people there and one side was scary and one side was straight. And I stopped like tens of people and like, take a look at this magical event. And um, and of course, rejection. Like, you know, like we as entrepreneurs, we deal with rejection every day. We are going out there. We are fundraising. I raised $28 million for Nana. On papers, it looks easy. It wasn't easy. There's a lot of rejection that's going into it. and, and Because this is happening, like in the mall, you said this is around 2008, right? That was 2008 to 2010, yes. So this is right after the financial crisis, during and after. Um, probably not easy to sell then, right? It wasn't. Uh, I sold hair straight needles for 100 bucks, um, and it wasn't easy. Um, but I pulled it off, and uh, it felt good. I learned a lot. It was my first business, and I'm very grateful for it. Why wasn't it your last business? Oh, big dreams. <laughs> um, Big dreams. Uh, you know, my dream is to, after my father passed away, I remember that there were some programs that enriched me, like programs where single moms and, and, and people that lost, and, and kids like me that, were, that lost their dads uh, was built for them. And I want to play a bigger role in education, uh, education programs, like, like a huge role in education which I'm doing today, right? Uh, and uh, Nana, for example, talking about my father again, we don't focus on people that, go in, that graduated from college or 18 years old that wants to go to college. I'm focusing on, on the group age of uh, 35 to 45. And that's where my, father, uh, that's where my father passed away. Mm. And uh, before my father passed away, something that we didn't talk about. 
Um, back in 1991, there was a huge Jewish immigration from uh, Soviet Union to Israel. So my father's niche suddenly had more supply, which plummeted his margins by 75%, right? Now, this is a, a, a respectful Georgian man. Georgians are very con conservatives. Uh, they have, a, have some ego to, to them. And imagine my father that supported the family and, and, and was very successful suddenly wasn't. And so, what was his niche? Uh, he, he had the dentistry lab. So from a place of, of like making profit and be able to support his family, um, suddenly to a place of the business is not doing well. I'm stressed. I'm gaining weight because I don't work out. I'm frustrated. I have much more arguments with my wife because I don't know how to deal with these emotions. My business is falling apart. I'm getting divorced. I'm passing away. Scary path. Yeah. Now, 35 million people might face the first section of it, of my job is going away. What am I going to do with myself? Think how scary is that? 35 million people. I want Nana to be there in this intersection. And we are for people like Robin Vostig, for people like Justin Nan, and many, many hundreds of people that already, already went through the Nana program nationwide. And also, I will inspire government agencies and, munici and, and uh, municipal government to partner with NANA. We had a partnership, uh, I think we told you about it, a partnership with the Economic Development Office here in San Francisco, where they uh, partnered together with uh, another nonprofit, Self Help for the Elderly, that is targeting the uh, Asian American community. And they asked us to train 30 technicians from the Asian American community, and they paid us uh, even $80,000 to do so. And we train people that English is their second language, which is also, if you think about it, when I moved over here and I was an immigrant, I treated my language skills in the disability of some sort, right? Some sort of disability. And we taught them how to become a parent support technicians and then they were able to join the Nana platform where they can find economic opportunities from leading brands like Samsung, G, Electrolux, supported by this business in a box model under the Nana franchise. At, so what, going point, at what point does this mindset shift happen for you? you? You described being in classes growing up that were higher level. You know, you were about to go to college uh, and pursue that route back in Israel. Um, but you're really focused in on... Um, a, a working class challenge and issue in the economy that's going to affect so many people. Not many people redirect their focus and their energy in that direction when they're on the path that you were on. Why did you? I don't know, John. Um, I think I just found myself here. You know, it's um, 11 companies uh, did the New Jersey business, missed my mom and my grandfather, moved back to Israel in 2010. In Israel, I started a, a, an import company and I had clothing shops. And then a friend of mine told me that he's been fixing appliances and has been making more than $15,000 a month fixing appliances by himself. I had back then 20 employees and I made $2,500 in profit. I'm like, wait, there is something there. And I am... Um, I traveled to Toronto to shadow him. He lived in Toronto back then. And I shadowed him for five days. And after five days, the light bulb went off. I'm like, oh my God, like, like we went to people and we fixed the dishwashers. They paid us $300 to fix this specific dishwasher um, between labor and parts. And they thanked me after? They thanked me for fixing mm. the dishwasher? There is something there. And I, um, I knew, talking about strategy, I knew all, all of my life that I want to have a larger impact. Larger impact comes from education and also technology infrastructures. And that's why I chose San Francisco. Like, I'm not coming from a tech background. I never went to college, right? I don't know how to code yet. But I chose San Francisco to start to fix appliances in, in San Francisco because uh, there is a high density of, of workers in tech, which uh, enabled me to believe that I'll be able to find a technical talent over here to partner with and build something big. 
And at the beginning, it was an idea for a, a travel company that uh, where you can collect data points from your friends to where they travel to and, uh, and build this platform to inspire people to be spontaneous and travel. Uh, and then as I, uh, back in 2015, when my appliance repair company did $4 million a year and had 25 technicians, I bootstrapped it to that. Um, I'm like, what, what am I doing? Why am I doing travel if there is this huge problem of People lose their jobs and not enough people in the trades. And I, I'm lucky enough to know what's going on here. That's how Nana came to life. So, so you were again, doing the travel company while scaling the appliance repair company at the same time? I scaled the appliance repair company between 2013 to 2000, uh, to end of 2015. I, I took, a, I moved to San, so I lived in Oakland and Alameda. And then in September 2015, I'm moving into San Francisco, to Soma in San Francisco, with the idea of uh, starting this travel product that I wanted to build. Um, and then during this soul search of three months, I'm like, let's, let's, let's develop the trade skills and make it cool again, and supported by a technology that can generate this win-win in the intersection between people that will learn the skill, uh, government that don't need to pay unemployment and can pay for workforce development programs and the skills, and manufacturers that want to work with one company, this uh, enterprise gateway marketplace that can enable them to be more efficient in a way that is more sustainable for the environment and, and us not buying things because there is enough trade people to fix them faster. Makes a lot of sense. So um, I, I always like to ask about an experience I call Death Valley, um, the hardest point. And it, I feel like in, in life, you've, you've already probably shared what that is. Um, in career, in entrepreneurship, what's been, has there been a point where you'd sort of hit a wall and you thought, whatever my plan was, it's not working. I've, I've got to uh, start over. And if so, what was that? Which business should we focus on? Whichever yeah. one, whichever one had the worst problem where you thought. <laughs> John, you, you really take me to hard places here. What's going on, man? Hey, that's, that's just, that's kind of what I do. But there's so much learning from these moments and how you get through them. Okay. Are you ready for one? Um, oof. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's how I found myself in the U.S. Uh, for the second time. Uh, life in Israel was beautiful. I have two clothing shops that sell in high-end brands like Dolce Gabbana, Moschino, and also mid, mid brands like Fred Perry and Lacoste. I'm uh, 27 years old on paper. I'm like high there when it comes to like successful people in my age, in my town, my hometown, Haifa, uh, especially because I didn't grow up with money. And then... Um, and my companies, for me to open my second shop, I took about $200,000 worth of loans because I had an outlet shop and then a regular shop. So I took $200,000 worth of loans to open the second shop, assuming that the profitability will increase very fast, and it didn't. And for these loans, my mom was my co-signer together with my sister and my wife. These three women that supported me and I just wanted to make them feel proud. And uh, back in January 20, uh, 2013, I'm realizing that I, I can't pay the installment loans anymore. And between realizing that I can't make the installment uh, uh, loans anymore to, no, to figuring out that my friend is making more than $15,000 a month uh, fixing appliances, I decided uh, to move to the U.S. to fix appliances so I can pay these loans back. So I moved to the U.S. I was, by the way, I, I didn't move here with like, oh, the great U.S., smile on my face, the beautiful America. That wasn't the case. I loved my life in I fire Israel at the 27 years, uh, 27 years old. Um, but I was embarrassed. Uh, I dragged my mom, my sister, and my wife into a situation they never asked to be in, and they believed in me. And I got sued by the three banks when I couldn't pay the loans anymore. So there was a day where I was served in my shop. My employees were there and they received like they were served by 
uh, by these law firms. And then somebody is knocking on my door and serving this lawsuit to my, to my house. And somebody's going to my mom's uh, place of work and serving her as well. And man, talking about how moment in life, I just wanted to disappear from this world. Mm. And, um, and I want to be vulnerable here because I think it will inspire people. And uh, when I'm talking about disappearing from this world, I'm talking about disappearing from this world. Yeah. And I remember going through these thoughts about how embarrassed I was and um, how selfish it would be to disappear from this world and how the right thing is to actually, this leadership, stand up and fix it. Uh, so I moved here. I was sad because from uh, selling uh, <laughs> selling high-end brands in a, in a beautiful shops in Israel to cleaning uh, chicken bones di- uh, chicken bones left over, over from a Miller dishwasher, it was very humbling experience. And um, I started to make more than fifteen thousand dollars a month. I fell in love with the appliance repair trade skill, and I paid this loan back within a year and a half. I kept my businesses and I uh, and I sold them three years after with profit. Wow! And I what? bought myself and I bought myself a Jeep Grand Cherokee as a gift. <laughs> uh, well deserved, sounds like. So, what you were breaking a cycle in a sense. Uh, it must have been really difficult to um, to be you know an entrepreneur uh, trying to uh, grow a business trying to provide for your family and tragedy strikes and things are moving in the wrong direction. Um, and, and you were able to break that cycle uh, by, by doing what you did. Is there something, um, you know, I call it a core belief that you, that you got from how you navigated that situation or what motivated you in it that you continue to use as you encounter hardship um, in in building Nana and what is it? What's the core belief you got from that Death Valley experience? The core belief is that one day we won't be here and we'll fall asleep and our parents and uh, this concept of self self-made, I will argue, argue with that because nobody is self-made. Like our parents made us who we are, our friends made us who we are, our mentors made us who we are. And then um, the core belief of like we shouldn't compromise in life and we should really build what we want to create here. Like we should experience, there is this library of life around us and we just pick different experience and have this taste of this new food and have this conversation with this new unique individual that has like the, this different life experiences. And um, so it's the core belief of like live, live life to the fullest and go after it because tomorrow might not be. And that was the case in my father's case. And it might be the case with me. And if I can move fast and build things, that's what I want to do. And I hope that many millions of people and billions of people will join me on this journey, live life to the fullest and learn the trade skills. Live life, uh, move fast and, and build things, which is a, which is a bit of a twist on, on a slogan that's been used before. So, um, you talked about the, I think you said $23 million raise uh, that, you've, that you've done to build the company uh, from investors. And uh, I think we can all see what the labor market is doing, the need currently, and the challenge into the future with uh, technology eliminating um, or reducing the pay of so many uh, working class jobs. What's next for Nana? Um, we, we didn't really talk so much about the apprenticeship model that's built into it that, that is designed to help it scale. But where are you investing and pushing and do you hope to see growth for the rest of 2022 and into 2023? Thanks for asking. So, so Nana is, again, just to remind everybody the concept because we talked a lot about me today. Um, the, Nana is a free online trade school in the plant repair trade skill right now that is integrated into a platform that... Uh, where they can find economic opportunities from leading brands like Samsung G. And also the platform supports them with technical support and customer service and, and fintech products. We, we build the brands for them. And what we see is online education is not enough because you can learn online the theory, but would you feel comfortable walking into 
into John's house and fix his, his appliances? No. And at the same time, there are many mentors that are about to retire from this industry. They just want to share their knowledge with apprentice, apprenti uh, apprentices, right? So we built a unique product where mentors can create their profile and then they can say, I'm willing to me uh, mentor mentees and then mentees claim uh, the availability of the mentor and they shadow them. And they shadow them on one specific skill uh, because we asked ourselves a question and the answer changed everything for us. The question was what generates quality in the trades? The answer was education and repetition. So we teach people how to fix only the beginning Samsung ice makers or how to fix only GE washers. And then we open the economic opportunities only for Samsung ice makers. And then if they want to be exposed to more economic opportunities and diversi diversify their skills, they now will learn how to fix LG washers and can more refrigerators and all of these different trade skills. And it's a game for them. And there is an interactive learning to it because the marketplace and the online academy is integrated. So check this out, John. It's, it's revolutionary because it's that, and that's the future of work for me. Like in the past, you went to school, you got a job, you forgot from school. In the Nana world, you went to the Nana Academy school, you joined the marketplace, and now Nana can know that you learned how to fix washers, and it takes you uh, two days to fix washers usually. Uh, the first time completion, the first visit, which means that you're going to make more money, is on 75%. Your customer Cisco on, on Kenmore washers is 48 and the duration on the LG washer is maybe a 3.6. So now the Nana system will say, everybody else in your cohort in this town has a duration of 2.4 on LG washers. Do this training that will enable you to do, uh, to get back to 2.4. Makes sense. And life, will, and life will never be the same again. It's, that's the future of work for us, right? One place under one franchise where you can get education, community that support you, mentorship, economic opportunities. And that's what we are building here. And how does your revenue model work then? Are you getting, um, does the work come in through you and you bill and then pay uh, the, the repair technician or what? Yeah, exactly. So it's, Samsung is a great partner of ours that really believe in what we do. And they will send the jobs to the Nana platform. We will match a technician with the economic opportunity. Um, and Samsung will pay uh, Nana in net 10. Nana will pay the technician as soon as the job is completed because we don't want them to wait. And uh, that's a FinTech product that we have. And Nana will keep $20, 20 to $30 per transaction. And so if Samsung paid 120, Nana will keep 20, the technician will receive 100. And we are the, basically, we are this uh, admin software for them, for the technicians. Uh, in a different world, they will need to have a CSR that manage all of this admin, and that won't drive necessarily efficiency in the fulfillment. And, and Nana does that as well. So we see a lot of experienced technicians, they're choosing the Nana path, uh, this franchise for the individuals. Now, at a certain point, and I don't know, maybe you're there already, I imagine you have at Nana this amazing data trove of, you know, month to month, week to week even, what problems are happening with various appliances uh, and how long they take to fix. So, I mean, we talk about, you know, there are review sites out there, consumer reports, et cetera, that talk about reliability. At, at a certain point at volume, at least in certain geographic areas, you probably know what's breaking why and how much it costs to repair? What do you do with that? Um, preparing supply capacity. <laughs> um, you know that during the summer, there will be much more refrigerator issues in, uh, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, because it's going to be very hot, similar to HVAC. You prepare, you prepare supply capacity for it. There's an opportunity for, 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 and for me, like from a business perspective, I'm using the language of preparing supply capacity from day to day life, it means that Justin Nan can increase his economic opportunities and make $150,000 a year. And it means for the government that instead of somebody going to uh, file for unemployment, they learn a new skill that the country needs. 
Um, and you asked about the revenue model. So we have two revenue models. One is the marketplace where we keep a fee on each transaction. And the second business model that we just proved is that the government will pay us to train people. Um, and then the government paid us 80 grand to train 30 technicians. So it will enable us to move even faster. And I'm inviting more, uh, more cities out there to please join us. And I'm inviting even more OEMs in the appliance support trade right now and in the future in other, in other areas uh, to join the wait list. And, and let's build this together. Let's build a product for tradespeople. Let's build one hub and Nana for them where they can um, be proud again in what it means to be a tradesperson. Talk to me about market penetration. Uh, are you stronger, say, in California, the West, or you know, in New Jersey, the East, based on where you've been before? Are there particular areas that are tough to, to grow uh, the workforce and, and the volume that you want? What, what does your um, geographic penetration look like right now? So Nana uh, was, was in 12 markets earlier this year. Uh, we are now scaling to 24 markets nationwide. So we started in the West Coast. So we had a, a big, a large penetration in the Bay Area. Um, and Bay Area, Phoenix, Sacramento, LA, um, and then this, the, in Texas, San Antonio, uh, Houston, Dallas, Austin, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, by, the end of, by the end of this year, we'll be in anywhere between 24 to 30 markets. Um, and by the end of next year, we'll be in 100 markets nationwide. When it comes to Nana Academy, it's an online tra training. So even if you can't join the platform and you can join the waitlist to join the platform, you can still uh, sign up to Nana Academy and learn the trade skills. And I inspire you to do so. So everybody can go to nanaacademy.org, even if you're an investor, um, and, uh, and learn the trades. You know, uh, I learned how to make money with my mind. I learned how to make money with my words. And when I learned how to make money with my hands, it just completed the package with this economic, with a sense of economic security that I never felt before. Um, and my wife likes me, seeing me fixing things. So <laughs> um, I, I can relate to that. My, my wife likes seeing me fix things as well, even though uh, I, I'm better with, with my mind and my mouth than I am with my hands. But we'll, we can work on that. Yeah. I, I don't know if Net Let's, Academy, perhaps. John, why won't you fly in and like to one of the of, of the classes and bring some other reporters and let's let's do it. You know, let's inspire people. Come, come. Like, well, come I, I do think I do think that this area is so important because there are a lot of people who are great with their hands who aren't going to be as good. Um, at least in terms of generating economic opportunity with those other with those other modes and in the economy that we're heading into creating opportunity for everyone and their talents and skills is so important. David Zamir, uh, thank you for sharing about Nana and Nana Academy. And of course about your own personal story, which uh, certainly illustrates why this is so important, why you are motivated to do it. Thank you for having me. How do you feel about our conversation today? Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, you know, it's it's one of those conversations that uh, I think brings together your story and your mission in a really important way. Okay. And uh, Morris Morris Williams is asking, is this live? Yes, this is live, and the recording will continue to live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, David, once again, thank you. John, thank you for honoring me and having me here. I appreciate you, and thank you for inspiring people with your platform. Appreciate you.